Without further ado, I want to introduce our esteemed uh, moderator, Judith Schept, with NJII, the New Jersey Innovation Institute, correct? Right. Okay, I got it right. Judith, take it away. Great. Thank you. It is really a delight for us to be here to talk about investing in the voice first space. And we have really a great panel of investors who are going to be able to talk about different funds that they have and different ways that you as startups are going to be able to attract investment from these organizations. Additionally, after this session and after the welcome reception up in the uh, up in the basketball practice area, we're going to have startup companies who are going to be there who are going to get a chance to actually pitch to you guys. So hopefully some of them are listening to some of these tips that we have. Now the New Jersey Innovation Institute, I know you heard about it uh, earlier this morning, but one of the things that's really a hallmark of what we do is really working with early stage entrepreneurs and scale up companies. We have a tech and life sciences business incubator on our campus the Enterprise Development Center. So we've got a lot of ways that we can work with and support startup companies. And what we'd like to do first is let each of our panelists introduce themselves and talk a little bit about the kind of funding and support that they make available for entrepreneurs. So we'll start with you, Kathleen. Sure, happy to. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, I think you'll uh, join me in um, my um, uh, surprise at the beautiful facility. Thank um, you. It's just amazing. <laughs> Uh, congratulations to NJIT on the opening of this uh, tremendous space and for welcoming all of us here to Newark. Um, I, I work, as Judith said, for the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, uh, so a state uh, authority with the mission purpose of growing jobs in New Jersey. Uh, and within that organization, my goal is growing New Jersey-based uh, technology and life science companies. Um, so we have a gambit of uh, financial resources um, to help companies grow in the state. And we know one size doesn't fit all. We have entrepreneurs that are fine with giving up equity. We have other entrepreneurs that are looking for free cash, although everybody's looking for free cash, um, but without any equity. So um, we have resources that include a fund to fund model. So we have investment across 14 venture funds, uh, over $50 million invested with a mission uh, charge for those funds to make investments in New Jersey companies. I believe there was um, a speaker at some point today from the New Jersey Technology Council Venture Fund. That's one of our uh, most active funds at the moment. Their first fund was extremely successful in both a returns perspective and a job creation perspective. Um, so that's one vehicle. We also have a direct co-investment fund where we will go in and invest up to a quarter million dollars alongside a uh, venture investor in an early stage company in the state. Very um, uh, aggressive terms relative to um, how much equity you don't have to give up um, and um, how much um, we look to work with the company. So for everything that we do, we want to help promote the companies that are in the state in New Jersey and make sure that you're ultimately successful. Uh, and then we also have a number of tax credits and incentives and one of our most popular funding programs, you give up no equity, and you have That's great. No equity. <laughs> <laughs> you have the ability to turn your losses into cash. Um, it's commonly known as the net operating loss program in the state. Uh, the award cycle is every year at June 30. We are oversubscribed this year, first time in quite a few years. And um, the average award last year was over a million dollars. So companies can take their losses, sell them to profitable New Jersey companies, at a discount. Those New Jersey co companies that are profitable then reduce their tax burden. The exchange time from application at June 30 to time of notice of award is six weeks. By the middle of August, you know. So I know for any of the entrepreneurs in the room that have fundraised, it's, it's a long and tedious process. And very rarely do I know of a scenario where you can get a six week turnaround and not give up any equity and get an average of a million dollars. Um, so those are, are just a few examples of um, some of the funding mechanisms that we have in New Jersey, and I'd love to talk to you about, about more of them that are here today, and you're going to see more coming on the horizon with the, the new administration and Governor Murphy's focus on innovation in the state. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I don't do free cash. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, Andrew. So I, I, 
I'm, I'm Andrew Ackerman. I'm the managing director at DreamIt. Uh, raise your hand in back if you can hear me. I don't know how loud it is. In back, can you hear me? Okay, good, good. I won't yell then. Uh, so we're a venture fund, right? It's ironic. We're best known for our accelerator, but the DreamIt Accelerator program, which has been around since 2008, is really the the one-tenth of the iceberg that's above the waterline, behind the water, or underneath the waterline, is our fund. It's a $50 million fund. It's a third, our third fund. And we're investing in three areas right now, urban tech, health tech, and secure tech. Uh, we only invest in companies that go through our program. But since we focus on slightly later stage companies, by which I mean pre-Series A companies, we've actually changed the offer and the program structure such that uh, it's, number one, not a large equity chunk to get in. The main thing we get is the right to invest in the round when you come out. And it's also partly remote, because a lot of our companies are not three or four people with an idea, or a cocktail napkin, or an MVP, but rather 10 or 20 people with a going concern and revenues, 100,000, a million, $2 million per year. So that's where we play. That's what we look for. Uh, and Come to me. I'd love to chat with you if you're in any of those three areas. So how much equity does a company give up when they join? We don't work that way. You don't work that way. So the standard, uh, like, here's 50000 for 8%. That's a good deal for maybe a, a seed mm -hmm. stage company. But our guys don't do that. We don't invest any money at the beginning of the program. Okay. Mm -hmm. We invest at the end of the program, okay. and not even just at the end of the program, when you actually mm -hmm. raise your next round. We have the right to be the last money in. That's so how really we work. Made, you've really kind of taken that traditional accelerator model and kind of flipped it a little bit. Yeah, so. we don't like to do anything the same way too many times, so every so often we just blow it up. Okay. <laughs> Great. Allison? Hi, everyone. My name is Allison Williams, and I'm the director of NVP Labs, which is part of Newark Venture Partners. Newark Venture Partners has been here for two years. Uh, it came together from you know, seven corporations based in Newark and the near vicinity who really wanted to see Newark participate in the excellent tech revolution that we've been experiencing. So together with our seven corporate LPs, we have a $45 million fund. Over the past two years, we've invested in over 40 companies. We've deployed about 13 million of capital. We now, our portfolio now employs over 350 people in the city of Newark over 600 people nationwide. Um, we're thrilled by the success of our, of our companies and it's really you know, just the beginning for us. The fund is structured as uh, two investment arms. The first one is, is NVP Labs, which is what I run. NVP Labs is what we call a bridge to seed program. We invest in 10 companies every spring and fall. They come and work from our co-working space, which is located on the seventh floor of the Audible building. We provide a variety of resources from one-on-one -on -one support in sales, marketing, finance, and strategy to weekly networking opportunities with our LP community and our venture network. At the end, we have an awesome demo day event, which is usually at the Prudential Center where we bring the Newark community together as well as our investor community. And we um, are really proud to say that 65% of our participants raise an institutional seed round at the end of the program. The other arm of the fund is our direct investment arm where we invest in seed and series A deals up to a million dollars. Another big benefit of the labs program is that um, if when, after you go through the labs program, you are prioritized for the direct investment arm. So it's, it's, it's great to get that follow on investment from us. I do want to mention that we are currently recruiting for our fall cohort, which starts on September 12th. Um, our, we're looking for B2B companies with 10 to 40K in monthly recurring revenue. If you're interested, please come see me after this. We also have an application on our website. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And I can tell you, having gone to a couple of those demo days, they are really super fun, and they even let you go out on the uh, ice and do a little uh, yes, we do. hockey practice for those <laughs> who are adventurous yeah. uh, enough. David? Hi, I'm David Weissel. I'm a co-founder and partner of NextView Ventures. Uh, we are a seed stage venture capital firm. Uh, we have offices both in New York City as well as in Boston, but we invest throughout the country. Uh, we're investing out of our third fund. It's a $50 million fund. And we take what we call a high conviction, hands-on approach to seed stage investing. 
So we typically will either lead or co-lead rounds. Our typical check size is about a million dollars into a two to three million dollar seed round. Um, and then we'll take either a board seat or an active board observer role to really work with our companies in our portfolio uh, to figure out what are those seed stage milestones that need to be accomplished over the next 12 to 18 months. And we work really collaboratively to help our portfolio companies uh, optimize their Series A fundraising process. Um, we have a thematic approach around our firm and our fund around what we call the everyday economy. And the idea is we're investing in startups which are taking best-in-class technology and then applying it to people's everyday problems. Um, and so about two-thirds of our investments are consumer-facing, and about a third are kind of B2B to C. And it all is around the idea of the, what's the end user experience for consumers. Um, I've been personally interested in the voice space for the last two or so years. I've published a marketing playbook for uh, Alexa skills. I've published a map of the voice uh, startup ecosystem and have been kind of really proactively looking at uh, trying to invest in both uh, conversational interface companies as well as consumer-facing uh, voice-first startups. Great. And uh, Donna is currently an entrepreneur, but previously had been involved in investing. So Donna, tell us a little bit about the kinds of things you used to look for in investing and a little bit about what you're doing now. Sure, so I'm a recovering investor. <laughs> um, so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, formerly with uh, Edison Ventures for about 10 years, so was looking uh, on, was on the VP of development there, and so business development, so looked at thousands and thousands of companies over the years. Um, not voice at the time, um, but uh, so I, I don't know that it's been. It's been makes a lot of sense for me to spend a lot of time yeah, on it yeah, since yeah, I'm not yeah, actively yeah, investing, but I am on the entrepreneurial side. This is my fifth startup now um, in an operational role, and so happy to kind of share war stories with you. Great, great. So we, we've heard you talk about when you get deals, there's lots of deal opportunities that you can look at. You know, Donna mentioned when she was at Edison Ventures, perhaps a thousand deals a day or not a day, a year that would come across. You know, Kathleen, you get lots of opportunities, and I know your staff is out looking, other people from the EDA are out scouting early stage companies, and I'm sure, you know, as well for the other funds, there's lots of churn. What makes a particular deal attractive to you, and when should someone start to come and talk to you about what they're doing? Because we always try to tell our entrepreneurs, you have like one chance to make that first impression. And we also know it's a relatively small community. So believe it or not, we all talk to each other. You know, we say, have you seen this company? Or here's a company that's part of my portfolio that we'd like you to talk to. So when should companies be coming to talk to you and what makes them attractive for you to be investing in? Stage-wise, I think yeah. you guys invest the earliest one yeah. when you start, and then David, and then me. And I think Edison was a little later, so then you can okay. take off after me. Fair. So I'm happy to start off. Um, so at the EDA, we say to folks, come talk to us early. Um, and we will, uh, as Judith uh, referenced, we have a team that works with um, the emerging uh, technology and life science companies in the state. Um, you know, we have a lot of companies that aren't quite ready for prime time. And um, we will candidly share some of that feedback with you. Um, we run an event twice a year called New Jersey Founders and Funders where we give you the opportunity to present in front of investors. We've had a couple successful checks be written um, as a result of that event. Uh, Newark Venture Partners um, actually is one of our fund to fund portfolio companies and they participate in that um, event with us. But as Judith said, you get one shot for a first impression. So we remind entrepreneurs of that all the time. Um, we also have um, kind of community building events for the companies that were not ready to write checks in. Um, you know, as Judith said, we, we do talk. So um, one of Allison's partner reached out to us and said, do you have any companies in this space and look like this? We sent them a list of three companies that we know in New Jersey that are in the midst of raising around that fit that profile. Um, so because of our tentacles as a fund-to-fund -fund investor where we give money to the venture funds and then the venture funds invest in the companies, we tell people to come talk to us early, talk to us often, build that relationship with the EDA. 
Um, generally speaking, our tax credits and incentives help earlier on for companies before they're ready for a direct investment from us. So Kathleen, if someone came and talked to you and they said, we're going to achieve this in the next six months, a smart thing for them to do might to then also be following up six months later and say, I told you I was going to get to here, here's where I'm now. I have to kind of keep you apprised of what, what's happening. Yes, and we keep files and everybody we talk to. So if you tell us you're going to do it, we're going to pull out what you told us you were going to do um, and, and check against that. We want uh, entrepreneurs who are, who are going to shoot for the rafters, um, no pun intended, and um, we, we, we'll manage and see how you do against those expectations. So there has to be some sense of realism in there as well. Um, we, for the most part, before we'll make a direct investment, talk to a company for a year and a half, two years. Um, so it's a, it's a measured conversation on a regular basis on how you're doing against your plan. Great. Allison? It's a great question because yes. there are so many, so many startups out there. At MVP, we have, we really take a proactive approach in reaching out to, to companies. Um, and we do this um, in, in a, we have a particular process for doing this. Well, first of all, we have seven, as I mentioned before, earlier, we have seven corporate investors. Audible, Panasonic, Dun & Bradstreet, TD Bank, Prudential, RWJ, Barnabas Health, and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield. And all seven of our investors are very motivated for MVP and our portfolio companies to be successful. So we have a great relationship with our, with our LPs. So we work very closely with them to understand what are issues and problems that they're facing in their business. So we can start to develop theses internally about areas where we want to proactively invest. So we have those conversations regularly throughout the year. We're constantly building out our theses internally. So for this cohort, we have particular opinions on FinTech AI, health tech, future of work, HR tech, and voice. So those were particular areas where we have a perspective and a point of view. And then myself and the rest of our team, we actually we go out and we get in front of companies. We go to many of the events that are happening throughout the city, New Jersey, the surrounding area. We are looking on Crunchbase, PitchBook for companies yeah. that mm -hmm. we want to proactively approach. So that's kind of our way of taking this really big universe and, and, and our way to attempt to make it a little bit smaller. As far as my advice to entrepreneurs, I don't, my main piece of advice would be, you know, reach out when you're ready. Reach out when you're able to have a very thoughtful conversation with an investor. Even if you're too early or too late when you, let's say, if you, you, if you reach out to me, if, if you came to me but you weren't quite at the, you were too early for, for labs, if you made a good impression and I like the way you presented your company, we will just track you and mm -hmm. stay in touch. Um, and I would say, you know, that way you don't, you, you don't, you know, burn that bridge right. by just being prepared for that conversation. And I think the other thing, and, and then we'll get to, to David and Andrew and, and Donna, is when some of these people ask questions and you're going to follow up with them, you want to follow up in a fairly prompt time frame. If they've asked a question, you say, I don't know the answer, I'll get back to you. It doesn't, you don't want to get back a month later. You really want to be relatively prompt in, in your feedback because I can tell you we had a situation with one of the companies we had been working with in our business incubator. An investor had asked a question. They didn't get back to them. I ran into the investor someplace else and I said, how's the conversation going with, with the company? And they said, well, you know, they never got back to me. So it's important to, to really, as you say, kind of have that, those managed, measured conversations. Mm -hmm. Except for those companies where you're thrilled that they don't get back to you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you're probably not asking them a question. <laughs> Are we done yet? No, sorry. No. <laughs> I'll be nice. David, it's yours. Okay. Uh, oh, our investment decision making process is very simple. We look at three things and three things in this order team, market, product. The word uh, for team, we look at just that, a team, not just an individual. We've invested in 75 companies over the last eight years. 74 of them have been founding teams, not founders. Uh, the one was an exception where we had, uh, had a previous relationship with that founder. Um, and we look for something in the team around authenticity. Is your past experience, not in terms of, do in terms of uh, duration of years, 
but is your past experience bring about an insight as to why you have an unfair advantage to succeed with this startup? Um, and then market, is it a potential for venture scale? And then product, we use the word a little bit more generally, and just like, given what the amount of resources which you've had to date, what have you created? So if you've been working at this for only three months and you've only raised 50K, you should be at a different place than you've been working at it for the last year and you've raised 500K to date. So we grade, so to speak, on a curve based on the amount of resources that you've had and the amount of time you've been working on a product. Uh, for us, it's about a third, a third, a third. A third of our investments are completely a PowerPoint plan and a team. A third have some product in the market, but not yet metrics. And a third of the time, it's metrics up and to the right, but they're not yet ready for an $8 million Series A. Cool. OK. I mean, I've actually been on both sides of this divide. Uh, you know, when I first joined Dreamit, we were a more traditional pre-seed program. So we were looking more for companies like you guys were. And, and you know, I would often come to you, David, and say, do you have any companies that are almost but not quite ready for That's you? Right. Now it's almost switched entirely the other way, because now that most of our companies have raised a seed round, and our goal is to take them to an A or perhaps a seed extension in some cases, uh, our best referrals come from investors who come to us and say, we've just written them a check for a million dollars. I want them to go through your program so you find them more customers and we can get them to a Series A together and co-invest then. Uh, and that, that's also yeah. where not taking a large chunk of equity up front makes it possible because no one wants to dilute themselves that way. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's one of the big changes in, in my life over the past couple of years about how we find companies. We still get a lot of inbounds, uh, and part of the reason is there just aren't that many companies, accelerators slash VC funds, or combinations like that, who play in the pre-A round. You know, it's pretty much you're out of an accelerator and then you just raise money from a VC fund. So because we kind of inhabit that, that space, a lot of companies come to us because to a large degree we're the only game in town. Uh, and we're vertically focused, as I said, in urban tech, which uh, just in case you're wondering, is construction, real estate, and the parts of smart city that don't suck, uh, health tech, and secure tech, which is physical and cyber security. So if you're a company in those areas, you get the benefit of a, of a program that's specialized on those areas of expertise and have dozens or more relationships with the customers who are looking for companies at that stage uh, not, not to talk to, but to actually pilot with and buy from. So it's kind of a unique position. So we get a lot of inbound that way. Uh, but that said, I, I don't just sit back and wait for people to refer companies. I still end up hitting Crunchbase pretty hard. Uh, we go out there. We call it the sniper and the shotgun. Mm -hmm. Great. And so, Donna, having raised funds, can you give some advice about how to approach and what you have found successful as you've gone out to, uh, to raise funds for the five yep. firms? So Absolutely. So I think um, what's really important, and I agree on your top three from a management standpoint, I'd love to see a CEO um, who's driven, a team that's driven, but also even a very sales-centric CEO because at the end of the day, you have to be able to tell your story. And if your CEO can tell your story, then everyone below him can tell the story. So getting your story in line and having a very clear, concise, this is where we fit in the market, this is how we differentiate, this is why we're gonna make a mark, is extremely important for that quick elevator pitch, for that quick um, introduction or um, cocktails, you know, um, talking to, to an investor. And so the, being able to make that point quickly and early when you're speaking to an, investment, an investor, um, critical. I think the other part of it is just you really need to be honest. <laughs> I think so many times entrepreneurs get that opportunity and they want to tell the investor what they think they want to hear. The reality is they just want to hear the truth. Um, they just want to know where you're at. You should have good answers, but um, I think they just really want to hear, you know, where is the company today? If you ask they ask you, who's a competitor? You cannot tell them that you have no competitors. There's always a competitor. Somebody can build something themselves. You know, they can build it internally. So um, that's an honest answer. You know? So I think you know, those kinds of things are critical to be really honest and upfront with the investor when you get that opportunity, because that being authentic, being genuine, will actually go a long way. Great, and I think one of the things you heard from all of these 
investors is that they're really somewhat engaged with the companies that they're investing in. They're not just writing you a check and then saying, okay, give me the report card a year later, tell me what's happened. We've heard from all of them that they've talked about the connections that they're able to help make with other partners within the ecosystem who are either investors in their funds or others that, that they're aware of. So that's a really critically important factor is, is these connections that the firms are being able to help you make as you move as you move your way along. I can tell you we had a conversation, Kathleen may not remember this, but one of our companies was in due diligence and I had asked, well, how's the due diligence process going? And she said, well, you know, they're kind of getting stuck in the financial due diligence because honestly, the CEO and his uh, co-founder were very technical people in the biotech space. They, could, they really didn't understand the financial model that was associated, and as your team started you know, poking and asking a few questions about the financial model, they couldn't answer those questions. That then caused us to go back and really create a program that I created with Michael Ehrlich from our, our School of Management on financial management so that and business models so that our entrepreneurs would be able to have intelligent uh, conversations with these kinds of folks. So I'd like to ask a little bit about we talked a little bit on, on some of the pre-calls about voice and what aspects about voice and voice technology do you find particularly exciting and how does voice play into some of the other traditional fields that we have as an interface for accomplishing kinds of things. So, so where is voice exciting you with some of the companies that you're seeing? Sure. So we'll take it in any I'll, order. I'll, I'll jump in. So, uh, you know, we, we look at it first from the industry perspective, and then if they use voice where appropriate, and that opens up a business model, that's exciting. Uh, you know, I, I think a little bit, I like to think in patterns, right? So I, I look at like what's happened before and what does this feel like? And right now voice feels a little bit like mobile when it first came out. There was a point in time when a VC fund could come out, and I have one specific in mind, and they would say, we are a mobile VC. We invest in mobile plays. And within three years, they couldn't say that anymore because everything was mobile, right? It was like saying, I invest in companies with a telephone. It made no sense anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think we're in that process with voice. It's new and exciting, and there are some platform plays to be had. But within a very short period of time, voice is just going to be one other channel or one other feature that you add to a product when necessary or, or when, when advantageous. So, you know, with that in mind, I look through things in like the real estate space. Uh, there are huge efficiencies to be had in automating, say, interactions with your property managers. My sink is broken, right? Things like that. Or I want to schedule an appointment. Uh, voice paired with natural language processing and AI on the back end has a huge opportunity there to just free the, the consumer from having to deal with people who, frankly, are overworked and don't want to be on the phone anyway. And freeing those other people from having to deal with, okay, I'll schedule that appointment for you for Monday. Uh, so there's a lot of that on the real estate side. I don't see as much on the construction side, to be honest, uh, but of course on the smart city side, uh, there is some very interesting stuff way down on the horizon where uh, you, know, you can almost imagine that all those video cameras that we're now starting to figure out how do we use with image recognition, imagine a pervasive network of microphones with speech recognition mm -hmm. and the kind of data you could get on what people are talking about, what problems are arising, what emergencies are arising. Uh, so those are, I don't even think, a glimmer in the eye of a lot of startups yet, but that's kind of where I see the ball heading on the smart city side. So I'll jump yeah, in. Mm -hmm. um, so in prepping for this panel, went back and looked at companies that um, we had funded that had you know, voice is a primary business. And, you know, my team knows that I, I often hear voice and cringe because the first big loss I had as an investor was in a voice technology company. So <laughs> it takes a while to get over that first big loss. Um, and when I went back and looked, there was companies in the early 2000s building voice technologies in New Jersey. And when we think about, you know, Alcatel Lucent and Bell Labs starting in New Jersey, a lot of that was voice technology. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll bring up a name from when Ed, um, Donna was back at Edison and Voxware. 
um, right, a boys technology down in Lawrenceville, New Jersey, that uses that technology for um, picking um, in inventory. And, um, and we're seeing a lot of that today, right, in artificial intelligence technology and in scenarios where security is really important. Voice is another security layer. Um, in scenarios where folks can't, it's not efficient to use your hands, right? Where mobility is really important. So we're seeing that across labs uh, in the state. Um, as I mentioned, Voxware uh, in New Jersey um, has been around for a long time in figuring out how to be efficient in warehouse management um, and logistics. Um, think about the, the FedEx and UPS guys. There's technology there for them for voice. So the mobility factor, I think, is really what's the, the lever that's elevating the interest in voice. Um, you know, people knew the technology was coming, have been working on it in a long time, and maybe we're ahead of the curve. And now that we see all of the demands from consumers on everything being mobile, it's, it's enhancing the opportunity for voice. Great. Allison? Sure. Yeah, I'm, we're, we're obviously interested, very interested in voice. You know, when you think about it, you, when you think about all the different things you do all day, you realize, well, it would be just so much easier if I could talk to this than actually type it on my, on my phone or on my computer. Um, again, going back to our, our LPs, we see that they are coming up with certain point solutions from a productivity standpoint, customer service standpoint, connectivity standpoint. You have TD Bank, you know, mm -hmm. they're really investing in voice. You know, if you want to get your checking account balance, how can you say it versus type of code over SMS. Um, from our healthcare LPs, they're interested in a point solution for elderly care. It's, you know, it's for someone who's, who's elderly and not as mobile, it's harder for them to get to an iPad to communicate to their doctor. How can voice be used to solve that problem for them? So um, we're working closely with our LPs to kind of understand where voice can, can really solve issues for them. As far as our existing portfolio, we have invested in a company called Veritonic, which just closed a, a sizable um, seed round and they are in the voice space where they optimize voice for marketing content. So companies that want to now be advertising on podcasts, um, they, they are going to, their, their technology, they have machine learning technology that helps them optimize what is the best voice for a certain consumer, mm -hmm. which we think is really interesting. And they actually just launched a, a pilot program with Audible, um, again, one of our LPs, which is very exciting. Uh, so as I mentioned before, next year we look at uh, investing in startups which are affecting people's everyday lives. And something like, I don't know what the exact stat is, 40 million uh, Alexa-enabled devices will have been sold by the end of 2018. They're selling dots and six packs. There's an Alexa everywhere strategy by Amazon to basically subsidize a cheap speaker and microphone and every single thing that you plug into a wall. To me, pervasive access to the cloud through the most human, natural human air interface possible, that is extremely, po that's extremely powerful. It's very similar to the beginning of the mobile era. Uh, you said eventually everything became mobile, but for the first five years of the mobile era, uh, new companies that were born, for example, Uber, that just took advantage of the new uh, platform in ways that were not previously uh, capable. And so if I knew what the killer app would be beyond, I mean, currently the, the, the killer app for consumers on voice is music. If I knew what the next killer app was gonna be, I would just start it myself. But I'm an investor, and so we're looking for those skills or those companies which are creating and consumer experiences uh, that are gonna transform our lives. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I think. Um the fact that we're recording all of this information and that, that exhaust, what I would call the exhaust, you know, all of this information that's taken from that, um, what you can actually do with that. I think that um, the sentiment analysis, the, you know, all of the, the natu natural language processing, AI that can be behind all of these things, um, voice is just the edge of what can actually go across the entire you know, errors and errors of, of technology. So to be able to kind of start to be able to connect and thread all of those things together, when you think of, you know, a customer service call comes into a wealth, you know, into a, uh, a bank, you know, 
if somebody's aggravated because they think their credit card has been stolen, being able to really be able to know how to deal with that in the moment, correct it, one and done, have a great experience with that bank is wonderful and you want to get on and off the phone quickly and resolve it. Um, may be very different than somebody calling into their wealth manager, they happen to be the top seven client at an enormous bank, you want to have a nice long relationship with that person. So if they sound frustrated on the phone, you really want to temper that because you don't want their money moving from one, from your bank to another. So I think there's so many really exciting things that can be used in a real business fashion from a voice standpoint. So I think as we, as we start to think what we can, the applications that can be applied and the layers of information and the connectivity between all of these things, um, voice can be really, really power to, powerful to enable new work processes, new um, efficiencies within organizations. I think, you know, kind of to build off of something that Donna said, uh, I like listening to the TED Talks that you can find on TED.com, and one of the uh, talks that I had listened to recently was from a physician in the UK who was actually saying by analyzing voice, it was an early indication of Parkinson's mm -hmm. disease, really using to your, your comments, mm -hmm. he, they were able to analyze someone's voice and use that as, as kind of a marker for some particular disease states, which really is a very interesting concept. Uh, I was actually going to build on that. Like, yeah. For those of you, who, just a show of hands, who's here, who's uh, working on a startup using voice? Okay, cool. So I, I would urge you guys to think broad, right? So, you know, a lot of what people think of in the first go around is, okay, I take out my phone and I start saying something to it. But think about what happens. You have a microphone in your pocket that's always on. So imagine if you don't pick up your phone and it's a diagnostic tool for Parkinson's. It's an always on tool. It measures your stress, your mental health. Uh, your positivity, your negativity, it predicts what you need. Like David and I are talking about Chinese food, I take my phone out and there's already Chinese restaurants near me on it, right? <laughs> so just open it up from this is something that I have to do to something that's always there for me in the same way that uh, you know companies like Google are just sucking up all that kind of digital well, I, detriment. I think that's some of the benefit of voice yeah. is that you don't need the friction of taking the phone out of your pocket and, you know, swiping and then going, yep. okay, this, that, and blah, blah, blah. I think, you know, uh, with a lot of the skills, just evoking with one, just one word just brings you to where you want to be, right? And so it's a way to navigate when you know what you want. I think some of the challenges I, I are around. I take it a step further. You don't What's even that? need to invoke it. It should always be listening. It's a little it should, scary. It's yes. that frictionless. <laughs> and it should be predictive to know what yeah. you need before you know yeah. it. Yep. Mm. So, Use that power for good, please. <laughs> great, great. So can we, we talk a little bit, I guess, about some of the investments that you've made in, in the space. What's the best way for entrepreneurs to contact you if they're interested? Because many of you have said, hey, we are looking for funds. We're looking for people to join some of our programs that we have upcoming. What's the best way that you like to be contacted from entrepreneurs? And what do you like to be contacted with? What do you want them to, is it a deck, is it a one point, uh, you know, one, one sheet executive I'm summary? chocolate. Chocolate, okay. <laughs> no, very and simple, just email, right? Email. Uh, Andrew at dreamit.com, uh, clear subject line, short email, straight into the point, maybe attach a one pager if that's what you're looking for. Uh, just do us all a favor, we all have websites. Take a look at them first, right? You know, I don't do a lot of B2C, I don't do live local sports, so I'm not the guy to help you with that. Save us both a little bit of time. Uh, but yeah, just, and then be a little patient, because depending on what's going on in our lives, it could be five minutes or it could be five weeks. I think the challenge is the best way to get uh, attention of an investor is to get a referral from someone that's in their network. But that can be, that is a real challenge. And, uh, to some degree, it's a little bit of a test of how kind of uh, 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 crafty you are as an entrepreneur and how much hustle you have to be able to find a way to get introduced. That being said, I think reaching out directly that has a very tailored email that clearly shows that you're contacting this person at this firm because you've given critical thought about it goes a long way. Uh, one of the most recent investments I made earlier this year was a, literally a cold email. 
Um, but it was so tailored to clearly had read our website and knew exactly what our thesis was around the everyday economy, and they tailored it to that, and it fits right into our thesis, and so that's why we made the investment. Yeah, I, I would echo. I only help companies that are in New Jersey. I can't tell you how many times I get requests to fund California companies, New York companies, Belgium companies. Um, and I She'll start, fund them if they move to New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> and I start from the point of, are you interested in locating in New Jersey? Um, but a lot of material on our website. I will not read anything more than a two-page executive summary. Um, but if you email it uh, to, to, um, to the EDA, it'll get to me or to my colleagues or to me directly. Um, and we'll get somebody to, to follow up with you. Same here, a well thought out email to the point, but has done the research um, is, is perfect. You can also apply to labs on our website and we always look at all of our applications. We, we take a look every day. Um, I will say, and, and we look at each, each candidate, uh, you know, we look at the you know, investment, um, on a you know investment basis, on a return basis, but I will say the one offer that we've given so far for the fall program, they did come to Debo Day, mm -hmm. they did come to one of our social activities, so it was just nice to see that they really did want to be a part of the MVP family. And I, I just say almost every venture capital fund or incubator has a section on their website that says exactly what they invest in. A great approach would to be to say, this is why I match your investment thesis, and put very clearly why, why you think that you, that you do. The other thing is if you're going to send emails to any of these folks, make sure that your actual address and phone number <laughs> and uh, contact details are on there, because as, as you said, they may be in Texas and you only invest in New Jersey. And so many people leave their address off now because nobody uses snail mail. Um, however, that's really important to, to a venture capital firm that only invests in either a geograph geographical region or an industry. So having as much there so they can tell if there's even an alignment is a huge help on their end. And I think you know what you've heard from all of them is also participating in the entrepreneurial community is important. So that whether you've gone to a meetup that one of them has sponsored, uh, Newark Venture Partners and Audible have sponsored a number of meetups at your uh, location in downtown Newark. Those are great events to go to in, in a casual framework, get a chance to meet people. Uh, the New Jersey EDA has a facility in North Brunswick, the Center for Commercialization for Innovative Technologies. They frequently run programs that, again, are open to the public, open to other entrepreneurs, whether it's a panel discussion on investing from foundations in the life sciences space or other programs. If you go to those events, you get a chance to meet people in this environment, and so that it's, this is not the first time you, you are approaching them to uh, to do something. So at this point, I think we have a few minutes left before the, before the keynote panel. I think we were also going to be able to take questions from the audience. So if people in the audience have any questions to ask our investors. Can't believe we have, OK, there's somebody right up front who had a question. Right over here. Hi, uh, Lawrence Beta with App City Life. So we do urban tech for cities. And uh, voice is very exciting for us just because um, obviously citizens want to communicate with your voice to their, um, to, uh, to their government. To your mouth? I, I can't hear it. So um, this, is, uh, this is my second, uh, um, second time I've gone through this type of a company during the dot-com days. And this is starting to remind me a lot of the dot-com days <laughs> um, just because you know, we do, we're doing voice and we're doing blockchain and we're doing AI. Um, what, what gets you excited about that? I think you've all talked about that a little bit, but also what scares you uh, about what's going on uh, with these companies um, in this space? Just because there's, there's obviously a lot of hype around um, voice and blockchain and AI. Um, so just what are your thoughts about what scares you about that? I, mean, I, I feel about voice and blockchain and every other, every other buzzword out there, it, it's a functional element. Right? And so if it opens up a new business model that didn't exist, that's very exciting. If it makes sense but is not core to the model that exists already, then okay. 
I'll, I'll give you, I get a lot of people pitching me uh, startups that have existed before, but now it's with blockchain. It's an equity crowdfunding site for real estate with blockchain. You know what this is? This is fairy dust. They're sprinkling blockchain fairy dust on it. Uh, it, it doesn't work for me. So if you're gonna sprinkle the fairy dust, like actually make it integral. Otherwise, I'm just, it's just noise to me. Yes, I think you know, what you're also hearing is that technology is interesting, technology is wonderful. We're here at a, at a technology school, New Jersey Institute of Technology, but really at the end of the day, you wanna understand how is the technology being used to solve a problem that somebody has, and is that a big enough problem that's gonna cause these investors to say, I can see how I can make money solving that problem using this piece of the technology. The technology may be very interesting, may be very wonderful, may even be something that could be prize winning, award winning, Nobel Prize winning, but what we really wanna know is what's the problem that you're solving, what's the value that you're bringing to an ultimate end customer, whether it's a consumer or an enterprise uh, customer. Other questions? I see somebody there. I'll be right there. Hi. <coughs> What advice would you give to a small startup looking at Amazon, Google, Apple as being very big players in the voice space? What, Michael, say that again if you wouldn't have time. What, what, what advice would you give to a small startup company looking at uh, the voice space, which is currently, there, there's some very big players, Amazon, Google, uh, Apple, certainly among them, Samsung. So I would be worried, right? Uh, Amazon has shown in the past with some of their partners in other realms that they're willing to change the rules mid-game, right? Um, I think it's interesting if you look at the uh, App Store, if you took the previous generation in mobile, uh, both Apple and Google, they take a huge cut, right? They take, what is it, 30% cut on the App Store, but they haven't changed the rules in a decade. That's, that's very comforting if you're trying to think about building a business model as an entrepreneur and as us as investors. Uh, consistency is key. And so um, I think having these larger players in the space and within kind of the uh, skills and uh, ecosystem, uh, you have to, it's gonna be careful navigation. And I would add, if you're trying to sell into Apple or Google or any of the big names, very long sales cycle. And I've seen too many entrepreneurs go out of business waiting for those sales cycle to close. You know, there's the promise of it's coming tomorrow, it's coming tomorrow, um, and they don't have adequate cash flow. So, you know, the old adage of don't put all your eggs in one basket, you know, is, is very applicable there. I, mean, the only, I want to be very careful. It's a, it's a large panel, so I want to use as few words as possible and say as much as possible. Um, but let's let take the Uber example that David put on the table. They didn't invent a mobile handset. They didn't invent location-based services. What they were using was largely, largely free tools that are out there to build a whole new model. So don't think of it as going up against uh, Amazon or Google to create better voice recognition. Uh, you will most likely lose that battle. But if you're using parts of their platform that they're giving away for free because they want to give away for free, or you know, open source tools to put together a business that is dependent on voice in a good way, then I'm not as worried about them because then it's like saying, Google can build anything, should I be paralyzed with fear? And the answer is clearly no. I think there's a, great. Hi, is this on? Yes. Okay. Oh, speak into the mic. Yes. <laughs> Um, we all know it's about uh, market size and the opportunity, et cetera. How many co uh, female founders are you seeing and how many female founders are you funding? Have to ask the question. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm looking at you, question. but I don't know if she wants yeah. you to answer <laughs> us. <laughs> well, in our last, I'm a prior female founder, um, so I, I think it's a, it's a great question. In our prior class, we had six companies and there was one female founder. So um, still, you know, not enough, but um, you know, we always are looking for a, a diverse set of founders in all of our classes, and um, you know, we're always keeping our eyes open, and hope to have even more in our next cohort. So, okay, I'll tread lightly yeah. here. Um, so, at 
the difficulty I find, so first of all, I'm not a nice person, I never claim to be. I'm not looking for any particular type of founder because I want to help out. I'm looking for great investments. Now that said, because we're not in the bubble that is the Valley, we just open our eyes and there's a lot more diverse founders, uh, ethically, ethnically and, and gender-wise. Uh, where I'm most constrained is the pipeline coming into the startup funnel. So in construction tech, I will tell you I have never seen a more white male-dominated uh, startup funnel. On the health side, however, uh, we are almost 50-50 in terms of female founders, including CEOs and in some cases CTOs. Uh, when we ran the EdTech vertical, it was about 30% female founders. Um, secure tech, I have no idea, but if I had to bet, it's not gonna be as good in terms of that. Um, you know, what I would really like, and, and I feel a little bit powerless, is I'd really like to be able to pull all the way through back to those construction firms and get more female, more African-American, more Latino founders into construction so they could get good five, 10, 15 years of experience, then give them the entrepreneurial bug so they start the company. Like, then I would have more to choose from. But uh, you know, I've struggled with it for a while and I'm not sure how much I can do at, this, at the stage in the game that I play to really influence things. Uh, and I have to admit, it's a little frustrating. So Michael Ehrlich and I uh, have a program that we run called Health IT Connections. And one of the things that we found as we were working with uh, the CEOs was that our female and underrepresented minority CEOs did not have as rich a set of networking contacts as some of the white male CEOs had in terms of other people to partner with and work with so that we found that it wasn't only getting them into some of the programs, it was really working harder with them to be able to provide the additional support to kind of retain and keep them and ensure that those businesses would ultimately turn out uh, to be successful. And in fact, one of the, the women that we worked with who initially when she came into our program, we were a little concerned about whether she was really too early and should she be the right partner to, you know, to be in the program. She has made phenomenal progress, has been able to now end up getting involved with Bayer who has a, uh, you know, venture fund and really has made, you know, significant progress. So I think, you know, as female and underrepresented CEOs, you need to make sure that you're also asking and getting the additional support that you need to ensure that kind of level off the, uh, level off the playing field. And I think Don Sebastian, who spoke on, on the earlier panel, you know, talked a little bit about really making sure that everyone's interested in tech and STEM, and that kind of pulls all the way back to, to middle school. It's a, it's a conversation that has to start early, right, with everybody, that this is a career choice that young folks can make, whatever their gender, whatever their nationality. And I was thinking back, walking onto the campus today, that last summer we had startup. Yep. Startup, startup nation, startup girls. Yes, right here on this right. campus. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So you know the conversation is happening in a new way. Girl start. Girl startup. Yeah. Startup girl. Yeah. Startup girl. I think. Yeah. 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 We'll get it right. Um, <laughs> but you know, it, it's important for everybody in the room to have that conversation. That you know, this is a path. You don't have to go into Lord, large corporate America or, or banking or you know. There's just so many different opportunities and. Um, you know, if you have the belly in your fi uh, the fire in your belly, it's 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 a great career path to, to control your own destiny, to start a company. Hi, hi, it's Sean Gilligan from the UK. Um, I've been a big fan of audio throughout the years, so traveling between the UK and America a lot, I'd be you know listening to hundreds of business audio books because I'm a bit sad that way, but. Um, and I've got my own book on, on Audible, which is flexible. It's only £1.99, but that's a side play. So I'm an international edtech entrepreneur over 15 years. Started my business in, in Yorkshire, age 25. And we've got offices in Chicago, Katowice, in Poland, and Leeds. And I've got a bit of a dilemma because I'm a startup guy at heart. And so Web Anywhere is the international edtech e-learning company where we work with JetBlue, Medtronic, Motorola. And we have market share in the UK of maybe two, 3,000 schools that we control the websites and apps from. But then I've got a voice-first starter, which I think is bigger than the existing company. 
So my, my question to the investors really, being a bit of a, a venture capital virgin, aka I've never taken money ever, um, a, if, if I've invested say quarter of a million pounds and whatever that is in dollars into a company, is that seed round or is that series A? And then also, how does a VC manage the conflict of interest between a bootstrapper who's got an established international business but has a startup idea that could be bigger and, and that sort of thing? So th they're the two questions, really. At what stage am I with my startup, and, and how do you manage um, the conflict of interest, really? So maybe I'll let David or Andrew. Well, was it, was it 250,000 pounds? Is that what you were saying? Well, David, that's your territory. Yeah, I would say uh, I think about stage and less in terms of what's the dollars or pounds into a company, but uh, where are you in determining product market fit? And is the, is, the, is the company ready to just put on capital and go? If that's the case, then you're ready for a Series A. If you still need to figure, you, something is working, but you still need some more experimental capital to figure out so you can get to the place where you just add dollars and go, uh, then you're somewhere along the seed continuum. And seed can mean a lot of different things from you know, 50K to three and a half million dollars. But I would think of seed as the process in which you're determining, does the company have product market fit? I'll, I'll build on that as briefly as I can. Uh, one of the proxies for that is revenue, yep. right? If you right. have no revenue, you're still looking for product market fit, obviously. If you have a certain amount of revenue and a certain number of unique customers, you kind of get the benefit of the doubt that you figured out something that works. Um, where it becomes complicated if you have two companies is, uh, I mean, I've started companies before. It's brutally hard to make one succeed. I'm very wary about uh, investing in someone who's trying to juggle two. Uh, sometimes, and I may be reading something into your, your question, sometimes we find there's an established uh, company that may be more of a service provider or a consultancy and then they'll want to create a startup to productize what they're doing, or maybe even totally unrelated. Uh, I steer very clear of those, because the founder's attention almost always gets pulled away to uh, an immediate gig, an immediate development gig, an immediate consulting gig. So it's a recipe for the small company to wither on the vine. So if you're serious about it, I would split them up, devote resources to each, dedicated resources. They cannot be pulled in the other direction. I would say put a manager in place on the, the, uh, the legacy business. Yes, I, I, I would CEO. say you choose. Do you want to be the CEO of the big company or the small one? Yep. If it's the big one, you're just the, the lead investor. You're the chairman of the board. Someone else is the CEO, has a lot of equity, fully incentivized. Or you cut ties and jump over. But don't straddle both. My advice is to do that before you go talking to seed or VCs <laughs> <laughs> to make that decision first. <laughs> You'll be much more successful. Great. Well, I think at this point we're going to have to end for the next uh, final keynote presentation of the day. I really would like to thank the panelists. I think they've really offered you a wealth of advice. I know most of them are going to be able to stick around a little bit for the welcome reception and the startup expo still have a chance to be able to speak with them uh, later. So again, let's thank the panel. <laughs>